Hello. On behalf of the Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Health Response System, I'd like to welcome you to this sixth presentation in our series of Be Nice Weapons of Mass Destruction. In this module, we're going to be talking about biologic agents and focusing on viruses and toxins. The viruses that we'll be discussing are shown here, smallpox, the viral hemorrhagic fevers, such as Ebola, and viral encephalitides. Now viruses, these are either RNA or DNA within a protein coat. They require a host cell in order to create their disease and survive. Many viruses are specific to a particular type of cell and that leads to the disease they cause or to uh, cancer. The disease that they cause may be a direct cytopathic effect. It may result from immune complex deposition. Uh, it can lead to end organ system failure and vascular damage. The sad reality, uh, as we have seen with our recent COVID uh, pandemic, is that there are few antiviral medications available that are effective against these uh, pathogens. And vaccination is the most effective means of preventing infection. Smallpox has been one of the most feared viral diseases. The photograph that you see is a smallpox victim. To give you an idea of how bad smallpox can be, this was an exercise that was conducted uh, in 2001. Uh, smallpox was released in three separate states. Uh, after two weeks, there were over 16,000 cases in 25 states and 10 countries, 1,000 deaths. After a little over a month, there were 300,000 cases and 100,000 deaths. The available vaccine supplies would have been deleted. There was, would have been significant social unrest. As you might guess, the healthcare system was completely overwhelmed. Um, the various governmental agencies uh, basically had some priority conflicts uh, in terms of things like who decides the priority for vaccination, what is the process for containment and quarantine? Well, smallpox or variola virus uh, is an orthopox virus and it creates a number of different forms of the disease. It's a DNA virus. Uh, we eradicated this as a naturally occurring disease in 1980 um, and stopped vaccinations in the civilian population in 1981 and in the military in 1985. In 2002, uh, in anticipation of some of the upcoming conflicts, partial military revaccination was occurring. Now, traditional spread versus terrorism. In traditional spread, there were isolated cases. At the time, we had a high degree of herd immunity and this was for two reasons. Number one is there were patients that had the disease naturally and recovered, and we conducted a really strong vaccination program. And there was easy contact tracing. The communities were smaller, the population was smaller, uh, and mobility was less. Now um, we have the likelihood that if there was a terrorist release of smallpox, there would be a large number of cases because we have no herd immunity. It has been over 40 years since we vaccinated most of the population and even longer since natural smallpox occurred. <laughs> and contact tracing is gonna be even more difficult. There's high population density and high mobility given the ease with which we can travel. Now, why is smallpox still a concern if we eradicated it? Well, unfortunately, even though humans were the only reservoir and there hasn't been a naturally occurring case in over 40 years, um, the US in its infinite wisdom and the what was then the Soviet Union in their infinite wisdom, each kept 
samples of smallpox. The CDC has its specimen in a maximum safety and security site. The Soviets, we know, have a copy, and we also are aware of the fact that they have weaponized their sample. Um, and with the fall of the Soviet Union, one of the questions that arose was, um, has the security and safety of their sample been maintained? Um, and where have the various copies that were weaponized gone? The other thing that caused a great deal of concern is the fact that there was a publication in 2017 in which a, a laboratory actually synthesized de novo a horsepox virus, uh, provided the instructions for how they did that, uh, and the concern was raised, could exactly the same process be used to synthesize smallpox uh, without the need for obtaining a sample of the uh, disease itself. Smallpox is highly infectious. You need less than 10 virus particles to cause infection. And aerosol exposure of less than 15 minutes is enough to cause infection. It's transmitted via the airborne route um, and we would expect that to occur in a bioterrorism attack. And then it would go person to person um, and potentially even in a hospital. And then infected fomites could also transmit the disease, for instance, in contaminated linens and laundry. The uh, person to person transmission rate. Well, in unvaccinated contacts, the secondary attack rate is in the neighborhood of 25 to 40%. Now, it's slower, pop, slower spread than diseases like measles, uh, but in the past, uh, contacts spread were only three to four contacts and maybe 10 to 20 in unvaccinated populations. So um, this is a real concern now, given the lack of uh, immunity that our population in general has. Infectiousness of the disease begins one day before the rash. Now, the disease is relatively easy to diagnose once the rash develops, but an individual is infectious 24 to 36 hours before the rash develops, which is obviously uh, a, a problem in terms of spread. Infectiousness peaks during the first week, and there's some question about a carrier state being possible whether the virus can be uh, in individuals who never formally show signs of infection, but are carrying it in their saliva. The substances that are known to be infectious are saliva, the fluid from the smallpox vesicles, the scabs, urine, conjunctival fluid, and possibly blood. Here are the forms of the disease. As I mentioned, there are a number of different types. Variola major, that's the traditional form of the disease. Uh, significant fatality rate if you're not vaccinated, 30%. Uh, still fatal in vaccinated individuals, although to a lesser extent. Variola minor, flat type, hemorrhagic, modified type, and variola without an eruption, uh, which is interesting because those patients don't have a rash. We'll show you some examples of some of these. There are three stages to the disease. The incubation period during which the individual is really asymptomatic, but the virus is reproducing. The prodrome in which there is, yes, that nonspecific febrile flu-like illness. And then the eruption itself in which the characteristic rash of smallpox develops. Now, the rash of smallpox. All of the lesions develop at the same time and at the same rate. It starts out as macules, it becomes papular, and then by the second day, it becomes vesicular. These can then become pustular. Eventually, after a little more than a week, they scab over and the scabs separate. And this progression all occurs at the same time. All of the lesions are at the same stage of development. Here you see that progression uh, in a photo from the World Health Organization. 
Top left photo is the beginning of the eruption. Top right is as the eruption progresses. The middle two photos are progression of the disease and then finally healing. And as you look at these photos, what you see is that over time, all of the lesions progress at exactly the same rate. All of the lesions look exactly the same. Here's some more examples. Um, as the disease is just beginning, the eruption is starting, all of the lesions look similar. A couple days later, more eruption. And again, the lesions are progressing and developing identically. Here's a week after the eruption began. And this graphic, while it looks fairly complicated, um, I'll just mention the top series of pictures shows the clinical picture of the patient. Um, they are in, uh, incubating it for the first seven to 17 days. The eruption starts and you see the progression of the eruption in the top pictures. Okay. Um, in terms of infectiousness, if you look at the bottom graph, you'll see that really uh, an individual becomes infectious one, one to two days before the actual rash develops. And obviously that makes controlling the disease from spreading a lot more difficult. Now, this is the mild form of disease, variola minor. As you look at this patient, a couple things ought to occur to you. Number one is the rash is nowhere near as extensive as variola major. Um, number two is that this patient doesn't look sick. This patient is upright, probably going about the business of daily activities and potentially spreading the disease to others. Here's the flat type of smallpox. As you look at this rash, you'll notice that in fact, it's not as uh, elevated as the traditional rash, although these patients are just as sick. Here's the hemorrhagic form of the disease. Um, these are patients who develop a bleeding diathesis. Um, they bleed into the lesions. And as you might guess, developing that hemorrhagic bleeding diathesis um, is not a good prognostic uh, indicator. So the diagnosis, well, it's gonna be made with the clinical presentation. Uh, that rash is very typical and the diagnosis should be made based on the rash. You can demonstrate the virus uh, via electron microscopy, uh, not something that many places can offer. Uh, there's a PCR assay and confirmation by tissue cultures, again, none of which occur very quickly. Treatment is primarily supportive. Um, we now have a couple of medications that were just recently approved in the last couple of years. And I'll talk about more in a minute. Of course, there is a smallpox vaccine and there's an immune globulin. T-pox, which is one of the two medications I mentioned, is an antiviral. Um, I should mention the approval came after animal studies only, no way to study it in humans. Um, the dosing is weight-based. It comes as a capsule. You mix it with 30 milliliters of liquid or soft food and ingest it uh, immediately thereafter. Some typical side effects. Brinsidovir or Tembexa, also approved only after animal studies approved only for smallpox. They did try this antiviral for cytomegalic virus, but in that study, they actually found an increased mortality uh, with the antiviral as opposed to improvement. Again, weight braced, comes as a tablet or oral suspension and common side effects. Now, one of the areas of confusion that commonly occurs is smallpox versus chickenpox. Well, chickenpox has a longer incubation period. Um, the chickenpox has really a minimal prodrome, if any, 
the distribution of the rash between these two diseases is very different. Smallpox really is a distal disease, meaning it's mostly on the extremities and head, whereas chickenpox is primarily on the trunk, um, and then it spreads elsewhere. The rash, as I mentioned, in smallpox, all the lesions look exactly the same. In chickenpox, the rash, they call it asynchronous. You've got new lesions, you've got middle-aged lesions, you've got old lesions. Smallpox takes longer for the scabs to form and separate. Um, and in chickenpox, your infectivity ends once the lesions have scabbed. In smallpox, infectivity doesn't end until the scabs have completely separated. And another good differentiating point is to look at the palms and soles, the palms of the hand, soles of the feet, because smallpox, those are involved, whereas in chickenpox, uh, they are spared. Here's a typical distribution of the two diseases. Um, the left-hand image is smallpox, showing the primary concentration being on the arms, legs, and head. And the right-hand image is chickenpox, showing the primary distribution on the trunk. And similarly, um, the involvement of the palms and the soles of the feet, uh, you see that the one asterisk pictures are chickenpox, two asterisks are smallpox, and you see the hands, chicken, you see the smallpox lesions on the palms where there's none in, in chickenpox. And same with the feet, smallpox, you see it on the soles, none with chickenpox. And once again, if you look at the RAS distribution of these two patients, you see the extremities being primarily involved with smallpox and the trunk being primarily involved with chickenpox. And here's a close-up of chickenpox showing this asynchronous rash. You've got new lesions, you've got middle-aged lesions, and you've got lesions that are essentially beginning to heal over. Now, post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, there is a vaccine out there. Um, it is protective if you realize you've been exposed and get it within three to four days. It reduces the incidence uh, significantly and reduces mortality by about 50%. Um, Health and Human Services has stockpiled vaccine and they say we have enough vaccine in the US to vaccinate 300 million people. There are two vaccines, ACAM 2000, which is a live virus vaccine that replicates, and then Genios or Invimune or Invanex, that's a live virus that's non-replicating. The importance of the difference between the two of them is that the replicating one uh, could potentially be spread from someone who is being inoculated to someone who uh, you didn't intend for the disease to get. And it has implications for healthcare providers because if in fact you get the ACAMP 2000 virus, um, the inoculation site has to be kept covered um, and patient contact may have to be limited depending on your role in the hospital. There is also a vaccinia immune globulin uh, to provide passive immunity for those who could not take the vaccine. Secondary infection, big problem. Um, patients are contagious, as I said, so um, all contacts would have to be quarantined for 17 days until uh, they either develop the disease or they remain clear of the disease. Uh, patients are infectious until the scabs heal over and separate, um, so they need strict isolation. Negative airflow room, if we did have a big outbreak of smallpox, um, one should consider cohorting patients either in a ward or perhaps identifying a single institution that's taking all the smallpox patients and airborne and contact precautions would be appropriate. This is one case study that happened. In 1963, there was a sailor en route uh, from Australia to Sweden by air, and he had multiple stops along the way. 15 days into his travels, he developed a fever and a rash 
he was diagnosed with smallpox. Nine additional cases were identified and more than 300,000 potential exposed individuals were vaccinated worldwide. Monkeypox is a related disease, part of the orthopox family. It can spread from animals to humans and humans to humans. The clinical presentation is similar to smallpox, but it tends to be a milder disease. The photo here shows monkeypox in a, in a monkey. Again, you see the pox lesions, but not as extensive as smallpox. Um, you see here, this photograph shows a victim of monkeypox. Um, and again, uh, you see the lesions not as extensive as before. It's not an insignificant disease. There is a case fatality rate up to 10%. Um, if you were immunized against smallpox, you are protected against monkeypox. Um, interestingly enough, there was a concern about possible monkeypox in the US in prairie dogs, uh, who are blamed for a whole host of diseases uh, in April, 2003. Um, and the concern was uh, that it was gonna become endemic in prairie dogs, which it did not do. Um, Precautions have to be taken, droplet and contact, and treatment once again is a smallpox vaccine, vaccinia immune globulin, and cydofovir uh, as an antiviral. Now, the viral hemorrhagic fevers. These are really incredible diseases. Um, these include Ebola, Marburg, Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever, Lassa dengue, yellow fever. These are all RNA viruses. They all have the following in common. They cause high fevers. They cause generalized vascular damage and hemorrhage, hence the name. Human infections are caused by either insect bites or contact with contaminated blood and body fluids. The photograph that you see at the bottom right is a patient with Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever. And you see this individual has bled into the soft tissues of their upper extremity. The target organ for these is the vascular bed. Uh, they have fever, they have myalgias, uh, they're very sick. Uh, eventually they get mucous membrane hemorrhages, they can develop shock. Um, the hemorrhages you might see are conjunctival, petechial. Uh, they can be large enough to cause hypotension. Damage to the kidneys and liver uh, is a poor prognosticator. And mortality varies based on the disease. For Ebola, which is perhaps one of the more common ones, um, the mortality has been running between 50 and 80 percent, uh, depending on the exact outbreak. Treatment is primarily supportive. Resuscitation, volume resuscitation and monitoring, fluid management, uh, nothing that might enhance bleeding, replacement of clotting factors and monitoring of their coagulation status. Um, in terms of treatment, there is now a vaccine that's been approved for Zaire Ebola virus, um, as well as treatment for that, three monoclonal antibodies, Inmazeb, Ebanga is a single monoclonal antibody that was approved uh, in 2020, and ZMAP uh, is a combination of three monoclonal antibodies still considered experimental. Secondary transmission is a problem. Um, you wanna minimize the number of people involved in the care of these patients. You need strict barrier precautions. So gloves, gowns, masks, shoe covers, face covers, eyewear, et cetera. Um, for any patient who has prominent bleeding, vomiting, diarrhea, cough, you might consider a HEPA filters um, and maximize airflow in ambulances when transporting. Uh, chemical toilet is uh, necessary to deal with waste materials. All body fluids need to be in, it disinfected. All equipment needs to be kept in a uh, container and autoclaved or incinerated. Uh, double bag garbage uh, and then disinfect it. Uh, and you can use paraformaldehyde for equipment. 
Um, the top image here, top photo, is a patient with Ebola. The bottom image is a patient with Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever. If you get exposed and your skin's intact, scrub it for 15, 20 minutes while soaking the area with detergent solution, germicidal solution such as bleach. Open wounds need to be copiously irrigated. Muc mucous membranes should be irrigated as well. This is sort of a summary slide uh, that shows the various viral hemorrhagic fevers and their typical disease complexes. Um, and uh, you can see that the time course is roughly two to three weeks, depending on the disease. Um, and what do they all have in common? Severe systemic illness, coagulation abnormalities, and then progression to shock and death. This is one case study from 1995. A laboratory worker in Zaire developed fever and bloody diarrhea, was diagnosed with, with Ebola. Um, by about six weeks later, there were almost 100 cases. There was a 92% fatality rate, and most of those cases were in healthcare providers. Uh, another six weeks later, they were up to 300 cases. Finally, the World Health Organization and the CDC uh, were invited in, and when they instituted appropriate bar barrier precautions, um, the infection was finally brought under control. And unfortunately, there have been numerous Ebola outbreaks since then, um, and you can see this list. Perhaps the most concerning was the one in West Africa that involved uh, a number of nations. There were almost 30,000 cases, uh, 11,000 deaths for a fatality rate of about 41%. And you may remember a number of patients ended up being transferred and treated in the US, uh, which created obviously logistic issues for transport and management of those patients. And since that time, we've had a number of outbreaks. The CDC uh, developed some guidance for this. And one of the ones that I would highly recommend, particularly for EMS personnel, is the EMS Infectious Disease Playbook, um, which uh, has a number of best practices in it, beginning with preparation, dispatch, transport, et cetera. Uh, it's a very good reference that I would strongly urge uh, everyone to take a look at. Now let's talk about the toxins. Um, these are things like botulinum toxin, ricin, T2 mycotoxins, also known as yellow rain, and staphylococcal enterotoxin B, which I'll refer to as SEB. These are all naturally produced poisons. And as bad as we think nerve agents like sarin and VX are, these are more toxic than any of the man-made uh, chemical agents. They're non-volatile. Fortunately, with only one exception, there's essentially no absorption through intact skin, and they tend not to spread person to person. Botulism or botulinum toxin. This is a neurotoxin that's produced by Clostridium botulinum, causing the disease botulism. It is 15,000 times more toxic than the nerve agent VX. I mean, this is just a stunning chemical. A, a tiny amount is, is toxic. And there's slightly different toxicity if it's inhaled versus if it's ingested. Now, if you remember how the nerve agents work, the nerve agents work when acetylcholine is released from the nerve ending the acetylcholine crosses the synapse, stimulates the receptor at the other side of the synapse, and then acetylcholinesterase is released to inactivate the acetylcholine. The nerve agent blocks the acetylcholinesterase, so we get a buildup of acetylcholine and overstimulation of the receptors and the target organs. That's nerve agent. Botulism works just the opposite way. 
botulism blocks the release of acetylcholine in the first place. So instead of overstimulation of the receptors, we have understimulation of the receptors. Instead of getting muscle fasciculations and twitching, we get muscle weakness and paralysis. We get nerve palsies because the nerves, the target nerves are not being stimulated. And what you see is a descending paralysis. And what happens is the cranial nerves are affected first. So we see blurred vision, double vision. Uh, we see droopy eyelids. Patients have trouble swallowing and speaking. And then this moves sort of down the body so that they get weakness in their skeletal muscles. Eventually, this can affect the diaphragm and cause respiratory paralysis. The photograph you see is a picture of a baby, baby with infant botulism. And if you look at this child, there's no muscle tone. This is a so-called floppy baby. It's a flaccid paralysis as a result of botulism. Um, botulism does occur, obviously, as a naturally occurring disease. Um, poor food preparation, poor food canning uh, causes it. Um, and uh, we see that not infrequently. Uh, the differential diagnosis includes a number of diseases that cause muscle weakness, um, but all of these should be able to be differentiated based on the type of progression of the weakness um, and associated findings. Botulism. Again, as a clinical diagnosis, you're looking for cranial nerve palsies and a descending paralysis. Um, there are ways to confirm the di diagnosis. One of them is called a mouse neutralization assay in which they take a sample of the patient's blood uh, injected into an unsuspecting mouse to see if it becomes weak or paralyzed. This obviously takes time. Uh, so the diagnosis has to be made clinically. The treatment is is supportive um, and many of these patients, if they progress to the point of respiratory arrest, require long-term mechanical ventilation. Um, antitoxins are available. Uh, there is uh, a heptavalent. Botulism has six, uh, seven different strains. Um, and so there is an antitoxin available. Uh, it has to be given as early as possible because what it does is it prevents the disease from progressing, but it does not reverse any findings that have already occurred. When botulism binds, uh, when the toxin binds at the nerve ending to prevent the release of acetylcholine, that bond is permanent. And until the nerve regenerates the ability to release acetylcholine, okay, that nerve is essentially out of commission. That's why mechanical ventilation is often required for long periods of time. It can take nerves anywhere between two and four months to regenerate the ability to release acetylcholine. And patients who have developed, for instance, respiratory paralysis may need ventilation for weeks or months until they're able to breathe on their own again. The other thing about the antitoxin is that it is an equine base, it's horse base, it's a horse serum. And so the possibility for serum sickness exists. There is a vaccine uh, for patients who are high risk and that is pentavalent, meaning it covers only the first five strains. Now ricin, um, ricin is a toxin that is toxic by a number of different routes, uh, orally, by inhalation and by injection. Uh, terrorists obviously would ideally like to use it as an aerosol. It, as a toxin, is 200 times more potent than VX. So nah, not as bad as botulism, uh, but worse than VX, than the nerve agent VX. It is a byproduct of castor bean uh, uh, product of oil manufacturing. Um, by inhalation, it causes fever, chest tightness, shortness of breath, 
nausea, and joint pain within hours after inhalation. It leads to airway necrosis, airway edema, and death within a couple of days. Ingestion causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, GI hemorrhage, necrosis of the gastrointestinal organs, liver, spleen, and kidneys, shock, and death within a few days. Um, injection causes necrosis of muscles and lymph nodes with multiple organ failure leading to death within a few days. So there is a common theme here. Um, this is a very, very bad toxin, okay? You may remember there was a a former uh, Russian spy living in London uh, who was poked in his calf by an assassin using an umbrella that had been sharpened at the tip with a tiny pellet of ricin uh, that got embedded in the thigh. And within three days, that individual was dead from ricin poisoning. The diagnosis is a difficult one to make, as you might guess. There are some tests that can be used to confirm the diagnosis. They all take time. Treatment is primarily supportive, um, recognizing that the case fatality rate is sky high. Um, there is a vaccine in development called Rivax um, that has undergone uh, some animal testing, but the FDA has not yet approved it for human use. I would expect that uh, eventually this will become approved. Staphylococcal enterotoxin B or SEB um, basically is a fever causing exotoxin uh, produced by Staph aureus. Um, after inhaling this toxin, you get fever, chills, headache, myalgia, non-productive cough within a number of hours. If you ingest it, you get nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Chest x-ray is normal. Uh, the bottom line for this is it makes you sick, uh, but generally it does not kill those exposed to it. Um, you're stable. It doesn't transmit person to person, and treatment is primarily supportive. The key issue about this is it will require uh, significant resources to manage the cases, uh, thus tying up healthcare resources. T2 mycotoxins, or yellow rain. This is a mycotoxin that is produced by the grain mold fusarium. It's a cellular poison. It inhibits protein and nucleic acid synthesis. It is the only one that is that can penetrate through the skin. It can also be inhaled or ingested. Um, it was used during the Vietnam War in Laos, producing a number of deaths. It has been used in Afghanistan, uh, causing 3,000 deaths. Um, and it causes a picture similar to a burn on the skin, redness, vesicles, skin necrosis, and sloughing. Uh, respiratory exposure causes irritation, pain, sneezing, cough, bloody nose, shortness of breath, wheezing, uh, blood tinge, sputum. GI exposure causes nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and bloody diarrhea. And severe intoxication can lead to shock and death. There is no antidote. Treatment is supportive and decontamination as soon as possible after exposure should be performed. Uh, soap and water, even four to six hours can reduce the dermal toxicity and charcoal can be used if the toxin was ingested. So for symptomatic patients, patients who present to you, they've been exposed to something, you're trying to figure out what it is, look at the clinical syndrome. If the clinical syndrome is primarily a pulmonary syndrome, think about anthrax, plague, tularemia. If it's primarily neurologic, altered mental state, weakness, paralysis, the neurologic syndrome, think about encephalitis and botulism. If it's a GI syndrome, think about the GI pathogens, salmonella, shigella, E. coli, et cetera. 
And if you see dermatologic manifestations, think smallpox, anthrax, tularemia, glanders, plague, and VHF, viral hemorrhagic fever. That gets you started until you can confirm the diagnosis. Thank you for your participation in this presentation and hope you'll take a look at some of our other modules.